that's doing it. Okay, so how's everybody doing? We are blessed. Hey, there. Hey, there. Uh, okay, I'm just going to do something like that. Okay. You get to read those reward passages. It wasn't exhaustive, but it was pretty good. What did you think? Yeah, he's given us promises. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do my best to make this clear, and so that we could leave this this service understanding what God has in store for us really that just a little more glimpse of that and um i'm going to ask ken if you would pray for me that and pray for us that we would hear we would that that god would help me speak you knew i was going to do that didn't you yeah, okay yeah. okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> well thank you lord we yeah. love you father and yeah We would uh, have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. And, uh, Lord, we respect that and we look forward to it. Amen. Um, as you have seen in the past and you will tell, I'm really excited about the promises of God and reward. And I think I come across that way sometimes. Unapologetic and unashamedly uh, very excited about it. And I'm just hoping it's a little contagious so that you would be a little more excited about it too. Here's my title, Oh Such Pleasure Jesus Will Have in Giving You a Full Reward on That Day. How's that for a long title? But it's his pleasure. Just keep that in mind. It's his pleasure. Another a subscript, to a subtitle would be, What the Scriptures Teach Us About Future Reward as a Pure Godly Motivation for Victorious Living. Um, now, this is, uh, these are the first, uh, this is like basically the first page of that weight of glory that I sent you the other week, and I think many read it. And I just wanted to bring attention to something, this one, um, this one part, it said, indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition while infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what it is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So considering the unblushing promises of reward, and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel. Have you considered the plethora of scriptural promises that God gives us regarding our reward in heaven? These promises are what get us through the storms of life that mature us, that strengthen us, they conform us into the image of Christ as we stand on those promises. Amen? You've, you've found that out. There's a song that came up when I thought about as we stand on the promise. Can you guess what song it is? Standing, standing on. on the promises. And I just thought I put it up here because the words are great. It's like, like guys, you're going to need these promises. Believe me. Now you could say, oh no, I'm, I just want to be a good person. I don't want to go that way, wrong direction. No, you'll need these promises. Look at, look at how he says it. Standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. He hits that home pretty well, doesn't he? Now here's the verses. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fears assail, by the living word of God, I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Next verse, standing on the promises of, of Christ the Lord. Bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the spirit sword, standing on the promises of God. And then the last verse, standing on the promises, I cannot fall. 
listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. And here's the chorus. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Not bad. We have a few free Baptists here. And that was pretty good. Okay, so uh, a paragraph from, uh, just to get bring this home, a paragraph from C.S. Lewis's uh, Mere Christianity. Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you'll find out that the Christians who did the most for the present world were those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who, who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. Oh, such pleasures Jesus will have in giving you a full reward on that day. Now, I, we, we, I, I'm going to just touch a little about what we touched on last week. We're talking about the Olympic gymnast, Gabby Douglas. And she was, what, 16 years old or so. And she was like brilliant. She was got all these gold medals. But who was happier and had a deeper joy when she got the gold medals, you think? Just what do you think? Gabby or her coach? Coach. coach. Who would have been more, who would have been more grieved if she would have had a, she did something foolish and went out drinking with her friends the day before and got maybe a bronze. And the coach knew she could have got a gold. She'd be pretty frustrated. The coach would be grieved. He feels with us. He, he enjoys giving us our full reward. That's his, that's his great pleasure. So when he rewarded the servant, whose joy is being shared? Remember this passage? His master said to him, Well done, a good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set, set you over much. Enter into the joy of who? We are enter into the master's joy. Come and share your master's happiness is another, is another version of it. Well done. So he said, fear not, little flock. This is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The difference between gift and reward. So I'm going to make a distinction here because many Christians don't. They, they, uh, well, I, I would say people that aren't Christians yet, they think they have to earn God's favor or earn eternal life, right? You don't earn that. That's called a gift, right? What do you do with gifts? Yep, you just receive it. So we talked about this. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. So here's the key word in there. I give them. That's a gift. Don't earn it. And they will, uh, eternal life, and they will never perish. And then it says, if that's not enough, like they're not going to perish, but no one can snatch them out of my hand. Got that? You're not going to perish, and you're in my hand, okay? My Father who has given them to all is greater than they. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now, whose hand are we in? got both. He's holding us, the Father, and the Father who's greater, he has us too. I and the Father are one. So eternal life is a gift we receive from Jesus the moment we believed in him. God's love is set on you. You're his forever. I just want that to think in a second. His love is set on you. Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall what? Follow you. Hot pursuit. That's the word. Just, you're not getting out of this. I'm set on you. Get stupid, I'll get you back. Okay, now. Bless the Oh, yeah. I'll just, um, I'm not letting you go. You're his forever. 
Let that sink in a second. Once you believe in Jesus, you receive from him the gift of ethereal life. Hmm. Okay, I'm allowed one typo. Okay. Eternal life. Okay. Your wrongs cannot disqualify you from being his forever. That's kind of an Armenian belief. You know, you're, you're, you're saved, but you know, you can go too far and then you'll get quali- disqualified. That's not what the Bible says. He says it's eternal life. So how long is eternal life? Did he give it to us? Did he give it to us? That's ours. Eternal life. He didn't say life. If you, if you do this and that, yeah, I've given you eternal life. It's built into the eternal life phrase there. So it doesn't disqualify. Your good works do not keep you qualified to be his forever. In other words, if you don't do good works, that doesn't disqualify you from being his forever. You are his forever. So what are the consequences for obedience or disobedience for being a saved follower uh, or a saved fool? So that means I could be a saved follower following Jesus. I could just be saved and have eternal life and do my own thing and be dumb. Somebody will say, so what? I'm still saved. You said it. I have eternal life, so I'm just going to live my own life. No consequences, right? Ah, big consequences. And I'm just going to throw this feed into you while you read the parables, many of the parables that talk about a person's kicked out of the party, weeping and gnashing your teeth, and, and Go, go uh, cut that person asunder. What All these terrible consequences do not have to do with the person lost their salvation, but they lost their reward. And Jesus tries to make that clear. So as you read that, go, he's talking about the He really wants us to get this reward. He really does, more than you. So this is uh, the passage we read, just going over it again. They were talking about who's of Apollos. Hey, I belong to Apollos. Hey, I, I'm Paul's disciple. It's like, you guys. He goes, there, we're servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each his role. I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. So neither who plants or he waters. Or they, they're like, stop doing this like, hey, I'm with him, I'm with him. And then it makes it clear why. I planted the seed, Paulus ordered, but God made it grow. So neither who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. He who plants and he who waters are one in purpose, and each one will be what? Rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you're God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds. You know, it's each one. That's you and you. We better be careful. For, for no one laid, can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. You guys are saved. You got the foundation. But don't go, you know, I'm of Paul. I'm of, you got you to gotta build with Jesus, not with anybody else. You, now, you, can't, you can't lean on other people, you have to lean on the Lord and be careful how you build the house. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, his workmanship will be evident because the day, that's the day we stand before Jesus, for an evaluation of our works, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed by fire, and the fire will prove the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as if through the flames. Do you not know that yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. He says, watch how you build, because you can be saved, but only as coming through the flames but you will suffer loss. This is what we're talking about. There is that possibility, guys. So both will be saved, but one will be the saved follower who receives reward from Jesus and has great rejoicing on that day. It could be the saved fool, which will have regret 
and has shame on that day. I'm not making these things up. Look, John. Now, little children, abide in Christ. I mean, keep your heart. The focus of John continually was make sure your heart is right toward people. Don't let grudges and stuff like abide in his love. So that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. He's writing to little children. He's writing to believers. So there's a possibility of either having confidence or being ashamed. And he's saying, guys, I want you to be confident. Come on, listen to me. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him. In this way, love has been perfected among us so that we may have what? Confidence on the day of judgment. For in this world, we're just like him. God is love, it says. And as in, in this world, we're just like him. Turn to your love. Probably your love. Does it say that? God is love. And in this world, we are just like him. Wow. That's got to wear that one, right? Got to put that one on. But that's what we are. It's like walk in love then, since that's what you are, your new nature, your born again nature. That's who you are. You're just like God in that. Not perfectly. I, I get it. But that's who we are. We imperfectly share this perfect, pure love of God. And that's what stays with people, not our, all our imperfections of it. But that's who we, we're, we're just like him in this world. And that's how, when we walk like that, we'll have great confidence when we stand with him on that, on that day. So my personal desire and prayer is that you would, on that day, just have the greatest joy because you walked in love and you just followed Jesus and you were his apprentice. And you, that's my deepest, deepest joy. I live for this so that people could come into the kingdom and at least get into the kingdom. That means believing in Jesus. And that those who come in the kingdom can understand the ways and the things freely given us so that you can walk in the light as he is in the light and just have that confidence on that day. That's what I live for. Colossians. Paul said the same thing. Him, Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this, for that purpose, I toil, struggling with all the energy that he powerfully works in me. This is not a work of the flesh. This is a work of the spirit in the apprentice of Jesus to not only walk in his light, but to help others so that they're ready on that day. We're always holding on or clinging to a promise of reward. It's either for the next life, God's reward, of affirmation, celebration, exaltation. We'll talk about that later. With this life's blessings thrown in, or we're going to hold on to the promise of this life's They become idols. We're holding on to the world's promises or Satan's promises. Or even God's promises that says, well, he promised me I'm going to have prosperity and he's going to, and we hold, cling to that, we lose our life. That becomes an idol. But if you hold on to the reward of affirmation, celebration, exhortation, God throws those blessings in. Here's the difference. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So they got their reward of, I got some recognition from people. Is it wrong to get recognition? No. But if you're clinging to that, I need that, I need that, that's, that's what their idol was. They worshiped people-pleasing, and they had their reward in full. We get a choice. You hold on to the promise of reward, God throws the other blessings in. Like, like Lewis said, aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, eh, you get neither. Jacking with me? Keep going. Yeah, I'm following you. Keep going. Is that what I'm picking up? I'm, start, I'm picking up? Okay, good. Oh, glad. I just want to be sensitive to that. Okay. We're always holding on to clinging to a promise of reward. The word clinging 
is the key here. Keep that in mind. Paul clung to the reward. Listen to how he did. I fought the good fight as I held on to the reward. I finished the race as I held on to the reward. I kept the faith even when the storms were coming and people were persecuting and, and it would have been easy to just compromise, which a lot of Christians are doing today in churches and pastors. They're being woke because they're not keeping the faith. They're going, well, let's, let's kind of, you know, stretch it here a little. We got to love people, so we got to, you know, compromise the truth. No, Paul kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up, finally, laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, he sees, which by the way, I've never, I've never, I never caught this, but I'm catching this all the time now. The Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. How, how can a judge award a person if he's not present and observing and watching what Paul was doing. He can't, he can't judge justly. What does that say? Yeah, he sees, he's watching, he knows. So he's going to be the righteous judge and he's going to award him on that day. Not today, he, didn't get, he was in prison. He's going to get killed, he's going to get beheaded pretty soon. He was real, this was his last letter. And not only to me, but also who? There you are in scripture again, right there. You're just like all over the pages. That's you to all who have loved his appearing. How many love the Lord's appearing? How many waiting and longing for the Lord's appearing? That promise is for you. Why? Because as you are and you're holding on to him, you're being fruitful and you're going to have great reward because you're keeping in the fight. Don't, don't, don't drop out of the fight. Look, today is crazy, isn't it? I mean, isn't it crazy today? And I know a lot of people are winning. This is just too much. The corruption, you know, the World Economic Forum elite, creepy people up there, and what's happening in our government. It's like, I'm just, I'm done. I'm done. I'm just going to, just going to do my little thing here. Stay in the fight as hard as it is. Because why? What do you get to stay in the fight? You get the crown of righteousness. I don't, I don't mean that we're, we're to get more politically involved. Though if God has you get that politically involved, get politically involved. But don't be weary. Say, what's my part here? That's it. You know, what's my part? I need to be aware of what's going on. I need to stand. And what's my part in my realm of influence now? that I'm in a battle. Anybody in a battle right now? Could be little battles. Could be battle with your health. Could be battle with, the, with um, people around you in your workplace. It could be battle in your home. It could be whatever the battle is, stand. Get your armor on. Don't give in. Don't give up. Just stand. And you'll win. Because he already did the victory. We're just standing in his victory. Isn't that cool? It's like, you know, oh, I got to fight. It's like, you know, just stand. Stand. Not giving in, not giving up. I'm just going to keep moving. I'm going to keep advancing what God gives me to do. You're not going to push me back. You're not going to get me to run. I'm just going to stand. Amen? Okay, just want to see if he's tracking. Be diligent to come to me. And then he goes on. I want to bring Demas in here. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So here was Demas. He was holding on to the promises of God. And as, as we saw last week, Demas was one of Paul's right-hand men with Luke and Mark. And he was just following Paul. And he was, he was moving in the gifts of the Spirit and all the blessings and all that. And he, he was holding on to it. And then he let go and he loved this present world instead. And he forsook Paul, having loved this present world. Keep this phrase in mind, loving this present world. And then he ends up saying, the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. This is at the end of the last words he wrote in scripture. Lord Jesus be with you, your spirit. Grace be with you. May the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. He is you, with your spirit. Paul was just waking him up to that. Winking. Grace be with you. And his grace is upon you. So, it's to all 
and Demas left him loving this present world. We read this passage last week, but I thought it would be worthy to go over it again. Among the Jews that went up to worship at the feast. Well, you know, I'm going to just, what I'm going to do is just say this one passage in here. To bear much fruit, whoever loves his life will lose it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Now, when you hear that, does that have a kind of element of radicalness in it? Think about that. Whoever lo loves his life will lose it. <laughs> I, I, aren't you supposed to love yourself and love your life? Don't, isn't that what the whole world teaches you? you got to love yourself and you got to love yourself. Let me tell you something. You naturally love yourself. You don't have to do much to love yourself. You naturally get up in the morning and eat and take care of you and always thinking about you first. So you just tend to naturally do that, right? I mean, is that right? And I understand that people have some problems like cutting themselves and beating themselves up and whether it's spiritually or physically. And there's a, there's a demonic influence that comes in there that makes a person do that. And they're not really loving themselves. But generally speaking, when you love your neighbor as yourself, what Jesus was saying is, you know how you naturally love yourself? Well, I'm going to give you supernatural power to love other people like the way you naturally love yourself. That's, that's really what that passage is. I want to give you, you have a foundation because you know how you care for yourself. You know how to do this, so now do it to others like what you do to yourself. But what he's saying here is loves his life like clings to it, clings to life. And my life, my, me, me, me. And he says, that's it, the person's going to lose it. But if you go, the heck with me, my conveniences, all my dreams, all my everything, I'm going to lose it for your sake. I hate that self-centered life and I lose it for your sake. We keep it for life eternal. Demas did the opposite. He loved his life and lost it. Whoever hates it in this world will keep it for life eternal. Like he said, aim at heaven, God will throw earth in. Aim at earth, you get neither. You cling to your life, you get neither. Be diligent to come to me. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. But now after having said that, let me bring another aspect in. But doesn't the scriptures also say that God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment? Doesn't it say that? Yeah. Okay, yes, it does. And I'll show you. I'm not making this up. Command those who are rich in this world, present world, to sell everything and hate their only rich. No, it says not to be arrogant, but they put their hope in, uh, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. Why? Because you should. Yeah, you should. Because it's the right thing to do. Because you're free. No, why? In this way, they'll lay up where? Treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold, cling to the life which is truly life. You got that? Isn't that cool? It's like, he didn't say, I mean, those are all good motives because you should and it's good and I, want, I don't want to be selfish and all that. But he's saying, no, I want the pleasure of rewarding you. So throw that up for later. You might not, you might not get it in this life, but you have the promise. And why are the, why are the Jesus and all the disciples and all the apostles why do they keep saying this? What are they like? What is this for people that just need that reward stuff? I'm I'm pure. I, I just do it because I love Jesus. I'm just a good person. And I just what what are they wasting their time? What is Jesus and all the apostles wasting their time? Like, like, here's 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 why you should do this. Like, no, 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 thanks, Jesus. No thanks. No thanks, Paul. Okay. So as your father who sees what's done in secret, he'll reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and, moth and dust destroy, 
and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for your treasures where? In heaven, okay? And then he says, the eye of the lamp of the body, the eye is the lamp of the body. When the eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Is that talking about physical eyes? Let your eye be single. So when we're singly focused on Jesus, his kingdom, and not, I, don't, I don't care about this free word here. You will throw it in, but I'm going for that gold. Then your whole body will be full of light. It says, it says your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, well, I want the world and I want this, I want this, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? You can't serve two masters. You've got to make a choice. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. God, money. Money representing this life, everything that money can give, all the securities, all the everything, the pleasures, the people please, everything. you got to hate that and hold on to God and his reward. How do we enjoy things, all things God has given us without loving our lives in this world? I'm glad you asked that question. We're receiving from the Lord the good gifts, but we're not clinging to these. Nor are we making them idols. We're clinging to Jesus and standing on his promises. When he, Barnabas, came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all with purpose of heart. They would cleave to the Lord. So that's what are cleaving to him and his promises. Peter, what is his promises? Let's, we're going to start looking at them. Look, we've, we've left everything to follow you. And she, what, so Jesus could have said a couple things there. It's like, well, you should. You know, I'm Jesus, and, you know, look what I'm going to do for you, and you really should that. Like, what did he do? He threw out not only this life, but the present age. I tell you, no one has left brothers or sisters, a mother or father or children who feels for my sake and for the gospel will fail. No one who does that will fail to receive a hundredfold in this present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields along with persecutions. Don't forget that. And in the age to come, eternal life. That doesn't mean the promise of eternal life. It's the promise of eternal reward. Eternal, the eternal life that comes in the age to come. The eternal reward. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Don't look to people that are successful. And it's like, oh, oh, no, you just keep steady. And God promises you, he'll throw in earth, earth's blessings. But he promises you in the age to come, eternal reward. So the present reward for apprenticing under Jesus, he, he, he meets our desires. We receive his blessings, but we don't make them idols. And our goal is, is the joy of knowing and pleasing Father and Son. Is that a guaranteed goal? Because a goal you have to take full responsibility for. If I say, this is my goal, this is what I want, you promised me because of his promise, that's guaranteed. You will know the Lord. You will please him, if that's your goal. And then in the future reward for the apprentices, our goal if we're going for that reward, we get affirmation, celebration, exaltation. It's guaranteed. Still with me? Okay, now, here's a passage in Colossians to who? Who is it to? Slaves. slaves. <clears throat> you think the slaves had um, seminars of how to find your gifts? <laughs> what would you like to do in life? What, what, what's your... What's your let me get your Enneagram here, and then let me uh, find your gift things, and, and then shovel the poop, whatever your master says, at any time. That's your job. And Paul promises, here's the promise of God, because if anyone needed the promises of the life to come, the slaves needed that. It says, obey your earthly masters in everything, not only to please them while they're Watching, but with sincerity of heart and fear of the Lord. Don't do it for their recognition. Serve the Lord. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart, with all your being, for the Lord and not for men, because you know, because you know, you know, guaranteed. Here's my promise. You will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Like he sees. Whoever does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there's no favoritism. 
And that way, I think was hinting because he read, went on to the masters. He said, hey, masters, you better watch it. You got a master too. These slaves can be passing up their masters in the kingdom to come if they're faithful their masters want. Think about that. And he's saying, like Paul's winking, I'm like, promise, just keep doing it. Obey your masters. Don't worry. You know, everything today is like, but they were slaves and Paul was not speaking against slavery. Most of the slaves back then were indentured, you know, indentured slaves. They, <clears throat> they were paying back a loan. But even if you were a slave, Paul said, don't worry about it. That's what they have to do. That's what he said. He said, those masters, don't worry about them. They got a master too. You can pass them up. You just be faithful. God sees and he has no favoritism. Whether you're a master, young, old, black, white, old, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. He has no favoritism. I don't care if you have a great education or you don't, low IQ, high IQ. If you are faithful, God will reward you. You will have an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. Amen? So whatever means, and this is beautiful because it's like whatever God calls you to do. Some people might be here in positions that you don't want to be in right now. You have to say, what is it God gave me to do? And if you do that wholeheartedly, that's a whatever. That counts for whatever. It says whatever you do. So if God's leading you to do something you don't want to do, but not you're quite gifting or whatever, but just do it unto him, you got a guarantee reward? That's the right answer. Yes, you will get God sees it. He will reward you. You do it wholeheartedly. You give it all no matter what the task. You do it worshipfully to Jesus, your real boss, not people for their recognition. And you do it for Jesus' wages. Not man's. I got all my W's in there, as you can see. Okay. You do it. They're not, my boss, they're not seeing what I'm doing. It's like, Jesus does. Well, but that's not enough. He should. It, 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 he should. He's promoting his son and these other workers, and you're doing a much better job. It's like, shut up. John the Baptist said, be content with your wages. You could leave, I mean, in this country. Okay, you're not a slave, so you could go to another job if you wanted to. But, but God's saying, is it enough that I see and I guarantee I will reward you if you do it faithfully? And then you can trust me. I got another something. I'm going to get out of this place and put you here. And just trust. Trust. What is the reward that Jesus is pleased to reward on, on that day, award us? Affirmation. Can you picture yourself standing before Jesus at the Bema seat? And he's saying, well done, Mitch. Well done, Dad. Well done, Dad. Well done. You want to hear that? And let that be resounding for all eternity. Got a well done. For all eternity. Or you get a hug and you go, I love you. You didn't do so well. But I love you and come on. Which one do you want ringing in your head for all eternity? Your choice. Your choice. Celebration. Now the feast. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I have not used, God's telling me to use my imagination a little bit more these days. I have not pictured what that feast is going to look like. I don't know how long. There's different interpretations of it. But whatever it is, it's going to be the party of eternity it's going to be like awesome and he says you're invited is everybody invited huh no no that's not fair <laughs> okay let's let's see what you're saying so god is not fair if he says you're not invited for a reason so you're, you're a better judge than god the parable of the person who didn't come closed with deeds the righteousness of the saints, not the inner righteousness that Jesus gives us upon believing, but the righteousness of you're walking with him, you're obeying him, you're doing what he says, and there's works, and there's your robe, and that robe qualifies you to come and feast and celebrate. Why? Because if you don't have anything, this is a celebration party. You don't have anything to celebrate. Now, there's going to be degrees of that. It's not going to be like 100%, you know, but we want to get, we want to get the, whitest best robe on in these days.
by his grace, not striving to please him so we could be accepted, but cooperating with Jesus as he's loving people. Just stop doing your own thing. What are you doing, Jesus? I want to follow you in this. That kind of life, that with God life. Come and celebrate. And then, if that's not enough, now take your position of authority and intimacy with me for all eternity. Is that for everybody? So everybody doesn't get it well done. Everybody then comes at a party. Not everybody gets the exaltation as a place of intimacy with, and a place of authority, which means greater intimacy with Jesus for all eternity, greater capacity to know him and enjoy him. This pursuit of his reward is pursuit, pursued and attained in this life only. Well, I'll just wait till I get to heaven. This is too hard to do all this. So much to remember, so much to do, and it's just complicated. I'll just wait till... There's no second chance there. This is, you're saved, but this is the time to develop character, make those hard choices, hang on to reward, go through the suffering and the trials that you and I need to go through. Amen? Yes, this is the day. Whew. From the way to glory again, the satisfaction of having pleased those. He's saying, we get taste of this here. The satisfaction of having pleased those I rightly loved and rightly feared was pure. So a kid doing a job and getting the praise from his father or mother, good job, that's pure. And that is enough to raise our thoughts to what might happen when, when the redeemed soul, when Mike, when Rose, when Dan, when, when the redeemed soul, beyond the whole hope and nearly beyond all belief, learns that at last she or he has pleased him who she or he was created to please. What joy on that day when you realize I actually pleased him. My life was pleasing. He said, well done to me. It's pure. It's pure. Therefore, we're always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him. You were created to please him. Is everybody pleasing somebody? Yeah. We're pleasing somebody. It's going to end up there's only two people, two persons, two beings. It's either God or it's going to be myself, which ends up being a slave and actually pleasing the devil. Because it pleases the devil to no end that we don't serve God and we don't please him. Please me, and I'll give you this. See, he offers promises too, doesn't he? You please me, and I'll give you this. God says, you please me, and I'll give you this. Now, you got to choose which one. We make it our goal to please him. We are created to be pleasers of God. And when we do that, we line up with him. That's, I, I love that. She has pleased him whom she was created to please on that day. She'll, she'll realize, or he'll realize that. So we make it our goal to please him, whether at home in our, our body or away from him, for we must appear before the judgment seat. It's like, please God, because he's worthy and he loves you, and he's worthy of praise, and he's worthy to be pleased. The reason he said to please him was what? The word for, whether in a home or body, away from it, for, because, here's the reason, you're going to stand before him and give an evaluation so that each one of us may receive what is due for the things done in the body, whether good or bad, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. Like, we know this day's coming. Paul saw it. Paul knew it was coming. He goes, like, we're trying to get you ready, guys. Please listen. Don't be lazy. Don't be fatalistic. Like, oh, yeah, well, it's all set in the mold. Don't, don't. Wake up. Wake up. This is real. We're going to stand before Jesus or our final evaluation. That's what the fear of the Lord is. You can't lose your salvation, but you, you and I can sure lose reward. And we don't want to do that, do we? Okay. But we please him not just for that day, but today. I was thinking a lot about this. You know, the reward, the affirmation, the celebration, the exaltation, 
Is that all laid up on that day? Or do we get some of that here? When you do a good job, you need to open your ears and hear the Lord say, I'm proud of you. That's awesome. It's awesome the way you just put yourself aside like that. That's not been like you, Michael. Amazing. Put yourself aside and you've cared and you've thought about somebody else. Affirmation starts today. And the consummation, the culmination of that is fully on that day and it's settled on that day. But it starts here. Celebration. Did you ever think of a moment that you had that God used you and you go, that was pretty cool. You're celebrating. You're like recreating a moment. That's what celebration is. You're recreating a moment. And you're, the Lord's enjoying that with you. And then how about exaltation? We get to reign in life. Not necessarily in positions right now, but influence. When you follow the Lord and you get victories over these trials, you're getting a greater influence. And in that sense, you're reigning with him in this life outside of position, then that fullness of the reign will be visible. Nobody sees that you who are following the Lord are a king and a queen. Nobody sees, but you walk like that because you're walking with him. He says, you're reigning. You're influencing way more than you know. A general who fights well in order to get peerage, which I had to look up, superiority among his peers, is mercenary. But a general who fights for victory is not. Victory being the proper reward of battle, as marriage is the proper reward of love. The proper rewards are not simply tacked on to the activity for which they are given, but are the activity itself in consummation. Isn't that beautiful? It's not just there, guys. The Lord's affirming you today and you today when you do a good job. You just got to open your ears. Lord, search my heart. How, how, how the, yeah, you have to hear that affirmation. You need that. You and I were created for that affirmation. And then the celebration as you rehearse with the Lord. Okay, so the present blessing is, is a joy of knowing that I'm pleasing my Father by apprenticing with Jesus in his love. Each moment as you're working, you can have that confidence like, I'm doing what God says, and he's pleased with that. At the end of the day, when your head hits your pillow, you could just enjoy, like look over the day and hear him say, good job there. Got to work on that one, Michael, but you did a good job there. And he's not so interested or concerned about all the mess ups. He's like, yeah, we're, we're going to work on that. But that's what I'm talking about right there. What you did, yeah, you celebrate. You see what I'm saying? You're celebrating the victories that you had in that day. Each moment, each at the end of the day, not just on that day. So the affirmation, the Lord speaks to your spirit when you're doing well, you did something well. If not, there's mercy. And then the celebration, recreating a moment, God bringing to mind ways in which he used you in your faithfulness, your love. You had faith. You could have doubted. You could have worried. But you had faith. You trusted me. You're patient. You were persevering. God wants to affirm us and celebrate with us in those times. And then the, um, and God can even give confirmation through people. Um, look at it says in 1 Corinthians, I was glad when Stephanus and Fortunatus and Archaeus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, recognize such people. Paul saying, recognize these guys. Like, recognize they're really doing the stuff. I want people to look at that. And I have to, you know, it's good to affirm people, isn't it? Somebody's doing something well. Mike and the crew, Ken and Stan and Jesse and Jeff, myself. Looks a little nicer out here, right? Well, I want to recognize that. You guys showed up. You worked your butts off. And there's a blessing in that. I'm recognizing that. Uh, recognize, recognizing and affirming people is a good thing. As long as we're not doing it 
and we're not living to get people's praise because he says, am I trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. It doesn't mean that we don't bless people and do the best for them, but not for their recognition. You tracking with me? Still tracking? Okay. See a little glary eyes, but I'm, I'm, I'm going for it. Exaltation. The, the assurance that because of your obedience, you will have a greater influence in this life. You will co-reign with Jesus spiritually in your place of influence here and now. God just enlar he enlarges your influence the more you walk with him. And in that sense, you're, you're ruling, you're reigning in your sphere of influence. Wherever you work, where you work, where you work, you have a sphere of influence. And, and you could either be under or you could be over. You could be the head or the tail. You could be the influencer or the one who's influenced. God calls us to be the influencer. The judgment that followed one sin brought condemnation, but the gift that followed many trespasses brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, we're talking about Adam, how much more will those, that's us, who received an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, have you received that? A few people here have received that. How many have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness? Yeah, when we believe that's the gift we receive, how much more shall they reign in life through this one man, Jesus Christ? <laughs> reign in life? We're not in, we're in low positions. We're not, no, they're influenced. We're reigning in this life. Following me? Present blessings, the joy of knowing each moment. At the end of the day, God giving confir confirmation. Um, at the end of the day, we reflect with him, and sometimes God giving confirmation through people. And then cons consum consummating in the final blessing of affirmation, exhortation, and uh, celebration. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help him. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. See, Paul's saying, you got a reward. You're throwing that up there that it will be on that day fully realized. We don't want you to become lazy but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. He wants you to get the promise. He wants you to not be lazy. And he wants you to realize that God's not unjust. He will not forget your work. What does that assume? If he's just and he won't forget it, what does that assume what he's doing? Observing. He's observing it. Nothing goes past him. He's saying, you can count on that. He sees. It's like people start pouring out, pouring out. and like, what am I doing this for? People don't appreciate me. It's like, you forgot. God is seeing. He's watching. And he is not unjust to not reward you. That's what he's saying. Inherit what has been promised. Again, Paul throwing it out there. You might not see it now. But he's just reminding you, what are the deeds that the Lord will reward, award on that day? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they have the pleasure of rewarding you both now and on that day. We'll talk about that day stuff. Affirmation, well done, celebration, exaltation. What are the deeds, the promises of reward for Jesus' agape apprentice? And there you are, right? There's your agape apprentice right there. That's you, okay? That's you. And then when we overcome, when tested, faithfulness he rewards, enduring pain, loss, persecution. These are the promises of God that you hold on and you will endure pain, loss, persecution. Giving, fasting, prayer. You know what that's from, the Sermon on the Mount. <coughs> Pray in secret, give in secret, fast in secret. Your Father who is in secret will see and reward you. Kingdom and gospel partnership and love is rewarded. So, overcoming temptation. Blessed is the man who perseveres on the trial. When he has stood the test, he will receive what? So why do I have to push this aside? Because, you know, God loves me. He knows. He understands. So why do I have to push it? 
I want that crown of life that you promised. So I'm going to push that temptation and endure and not jump ship. I'm going for it. Amen? That's the, you're blessed who perseveres under trial when you're tested. Let's see, is Michael going to go that stupid way that he normally goes? Or is he finally got, ah, he did it. He's coming with me. He's doing it my way. Yay. And, and everybody's rejoicing. Faithfulness. Okay? Slaves obey your earthly masters and everything. We went over that. All that slave has to do is be faithful and do what his master says. I mean, if the master gets weird, he could always run away. I mean, it's, you, you know, but, you know, generally, just probably, you know, you're in the corporate world, you're in the corporate world, just your percentage bosses that are really awesome, good. You know, how many percent are good? How many percent would be on the 50% and less? terrible bosses, what would you say, good, good bosses, what would you say, that you've seen and observed in, in your own life? Low. 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 Yeah. Okay, how about you, Mitch? The boss. Depends on the company. Some the, companies I say 75%. Wow, okay. Some companies I say 25%. Okay, so overall 50%. about 50-50. So he says, it doesn't matter your inheritance is not coming from them. You be faithful to that dumb boss, to that boss that doesn't recognize my awesome gifts, that doesn't see, you know, promote me when he should. doesn't matter. I'm faithful. We get the inheritance. God rewards faithfulness with affirmation, celebration, and exaltation. God's not unjust. We just read that. Then, good and faithful servant now enter into the joy of the master. All this guy took his ten, ta you know, five talents, made another two talents. The guy who didn't, he's like, no, you can't share the master's happiness. Then we have enduring pain, loss, and persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Wait, what, what did he say? Blessed are those who are per. How, how is a happy? Hey, he's happy because he's persecuted. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. Not now. You're going to get persecuted, maybe killed, canceled. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you, you're in the persecution club now. You're in the... You're in the just with the prophets and Jesus and everybody, you are in that club now, and they're rejoicing in heaven right now. It's like, yeah, 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 he, he was good on his promise. Yeah, go for it. Keep going. It is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. Who will reign with him? Those who endure. All the saved will reign with him? No. Those who endure will reign with him. If we deny him, he'll also deny us of reward, if you look at the context of that. But if we're faithful, he still remains faithful. He can't deny himself. So he, he will either reward us or deny us of reward. It depends on our response. And the Spirit is always, by the way, always enabling us to do the impossible, to do what God calls us. The Spirit is in us. We don't have the strength. Yeah, I understand that. But we do have the strength because... The Spirit is in us, always empowering us, giving us the strength in our weakness to do what we can't do without Him. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. And if we're God's children, then we are heirs. If we're heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer, we're co-heirs if we do what? We are all heirs. We're in. We inherited. Based on Jesus' work, we're, we're in. But we're co-heirs with Christ, if we suffer him, so that we may be glorified with him, I consider our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us, that will be. You notice, notice that? It's, it will be revealed in us on that day. And then we have giving, fasting, prayer. I'll just take the last part, the fasting. Your Father who sees what is done in secret re reward you. So he says, you do that in secret. Don't show everybody I'm fasting. Look at how spiritual I am. You will be rewarded because your Father sees you. Don't store up yourself treasures, you know, where your treasure is, your heart will also be also. So Jesus is continually saying, guys, you know, I know you love me. 
But Peter, Peter also loved the Lord, didn't he? And he said, Jesus, I love you so much. I will die for you. And Jesus said, no, you won't. No, no. You, you don't, you're, you're going to deny me three times. <laughs> I would love to. Lord, I, I don't need the reward. I am just so bubbly in love with you, Jesus. Whatever you say. And I, I think there may have been exceptions. I'm not even saying there's, but I'm not one of them, okay? I am not one that people just love Jesus so much, whatever you say. Jesus did not expect that of us. He said, nah, you're going to be just like Peter. You're going to bail. You're going to deny me. But I'm going to give you something to hold on to. And then you, you could walk with courage because you have something awaiting you from me. Still tracking with me? And then, kingdom gospel participation. When he says, my fruit is to do the will of him who sent me. Don't say there's, three, there's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Come on. Come on, people need to get saved. Here's the harvest. And you should do it because you love people and you love me. No, he says, already the reaper draws wages. What are you talking about wages? And gathers crop for eternal life, eternal reward. Already the reaper, he goes right into, they're laying up treasures, man. Get in on the harvest. Pray that the God send laborers so that the sower and reaper rejoice together. For in this case, the saying, one sows the other reap, I sent you to reap where you have not worked. Others have done the hard work and now you have taken up their labor. When I mean kingdom participation, that your life isn't just about you, but it's about how can we, how could God use my life to point somebody else to the Lord so I could share the gospel with them, so I could help them in their need, their time of need, whether it's a brother or an unsaved person. I'm an I'm a apprentice of Jesus in, the, in, in working for the good news to get out. That's part of our vocation as followers of Jesus. When we believe, we signed up for that. And then finally, of course, you could do all that. However came temptation, I'm faithful in my work. I endured pain and loss. I'm giving and pressing. And, and participating in the gospel, but I don't have love. I don't know. If, I honestly don't know if that cancels it all out or it's like, well, we got this. But if we don't keep our heart right toward people, just, just at least pray God's mercy on them. Don't hold grudges. Work at, if we, like, what did Paul say? He said, if I don't have love, I am nothing. If I don't have love, I gain nothing. Oh, what are you talking about gain nothing? This is love. Love doesn't think about your own gain. Well, if you read that way to glory, you do think of your own gain. You can't not think of your own gain. God wants you to think of your own gain. What am I going to gain from this? I'm going to gain intimacy with Jesus now. I'm going to gain reward in heaven. Why did Paul put this in if love is just so selfless? We're not even thinking. Like Paul, let, let's take that out. You are nothing if you don't have, but if you don't have love, Let's put that again. You are nothing. Not gain. Patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. So again, I'm, I'm, I, I, I get the feeling when I'm talking that I'm talking against most of what I've heard. Oh, just be selfless. Don't think of yourself at all in this. Like, Don't think of yourself of what you can gain in this life. But for God's sake and Jesus' sake and the kingdom's sake, think of what you can gain in the treasures that you lay up. I agree that you shouldn't think, well, what would they think of me? What am I going to get out of this? Put all that aside. That's loving your life here. You, you see the difference? Is that clear? But this selfless, I don't even need reward. That's, that's pride. That's arrogance. That's saying, Jesus, you got it wrong. So when we're, all those lines going up there, what we're doing, when we hold on to reward, what are we really holding on to? We find Jesus there. Cling to my promise of reward, and you'll discover you're clinging to me because that's Jesus' promise, and he's connected to that promise. Cleave to the Lord. And then when we fall, God puts this little springboard. So, so here's, we didn't overcome temptation. Boom, you're back up. You're, you're, you're going again. Boom, 
Because underneath this whole stuff, if you're apprentice of Jesus and you're in training, if when you fall, he provides this repentance springboard because you've got the flesh pulling on you. Anybody ever feel the flesh pulling on you? Huh? Constantly. Don't tell me you're not going to make this without uh, the flesh. That's nothing. I don't need reward. To, you need reward to overcome the flesh. That's what the scriptures say. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. How about the world? All the, all the temptations out there in the world. All the things the world offers us. It's pulling on us to make them idols and not, not hang on to that. And then the devil, if that's not enough. And all these things are invisible. I mean, I have flesh, but I don't feel the pulls. I don't, I don't, the, the, the world is just kind of like, this ubiquitous, ubiquitous lies that are coming all the time to us. And then the devil honing in on those lies. You're nothing and you want this. Come on, this, you know, just kind of do the, make it look like you're a Christian, but don't, don't go all the way. That's, that's weird. You're, you're going to look weird. Look, I could make you look good as a Christian and still, you know, give you the stuff you want. And, and we're fighting that every day. Anybody? Okay, I'm not alone here. Money and security. Pleasures and material goods. People pleasing and pride. Avoiding pain. Oh, anything to avoid pain and, and some change or difference. Oh, I'll do anything. I don't want that. And they become idols. And we don't go after what God wants. So, Last word of John, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. That's his last word in 1 John chapter 5, last verse in there. We got all these things pulling and we got a repentance springboard. We got some good things going for us, amen? So you want to hold on to the Lord's reward instead of the idols that Satan says. We want to, here's my word, closing word, don't become lazy. Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what's been promised. You grab a hold of reward, you grab a hold of him. The enemies of this, pride. Yes, Jesus in the Bible emphasizes the word, but I don't need it. I have Jesus. Fatalism. Ah, it doesn't matter. It's all set in the mold. We can't do anything about our reward. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Don't let the enemy say, ah, Whatever will be, will be. Doesn't matter. Where's this? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You could lose your reward. Where's, where's that word? Ah, Jesus doesn't want me to fear and tremble. He just loves me. He just wants me to. See, there's a fatalistic spirit here that causes us to be passive instead of pressing in. I press in. I take hold of that which I am taking hold of. I apprehend that which I'm going to. It, there's, this, there's this battle going on and this inner work of the Spirit to press in and to hold on to that reward. Don't be fatalistic or not understanding the whole Scripture. God wants me to be happy. I'll just live in the present. Shouldn't we just live in the present? Yes, yes, we should always live in the present. But nobody lives in the present. You're foolish if you don't, if you don't look back and see what you could learn from history and your own history. You're foolish if you don't have that reward. We're living in three dimensions. We live in the present with our hands hold on that and learning from the past and moving on. It's a three-dimensional walk. It's not just this flowery. I just live in the present. It's good to live in the present. I'm living in the present more, but you only can really be effective in the present, like Lewis said, if you have a hold of where you're going. Sometimes all the present blessings, feelings are gone. And if you don't hold on to the future reward, as the heroes of the faith did, in Hebrews 11, that's all they were holding on to. The flesh will pull us, the world will lure us, and the devil who sees we are not standing on the promises of future reward will very likely overtake us. Since we know Jesus is pleased, we will hold on to his promise of future reward we will get to know him in a more intimate way as we stand on those promises. In other words, this motivation is effective and it pleases him. So we get to experience him as we stand on the promise of future reward and will please him on that day when he says, well done, come and celebrate and rule with me. 
that you get the full reward, live for his pleasure. So, Father, thank you. did it as best as I can. Um, this is your word, not mine. There's uh, many passages that you see being in the flesh, being fallen, that we have to hold on to something later and endure and be faithful in order to walk with you in a, in a relaxed way. We can relax when we're sold out to you for that. And we don't really relax when we're double-minded. I want it, I want it now, but I want it later too. But if you throw in the now, hallelujah. But we're going for going for the reward that you promised, you guaranteed. This life is a vapor. Lord, only one life soon will be a pass. Only what's done by you and through you will last for eternity. Let us invest our lives, Lord, and get that perspective that whatever we do, that we would do it unto you. And you see, and you will reward. And we're all going to stand before you one day. We're going to be before the, your seat. And as long as I'm in this flesh, I'm going to think about this, I'm going to pursue it, and I'm going to try to bring as many as I can with me so that we could all be jumping for joy, dancing in the Spirit on that day when you say, well done. Come and, come and celebrate and take your place eternal place of intimacy with me in the kingdom to come. I pray that for me and for each here. May it be so in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.